friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear for today's ages, we need to be prepared for Jesus Christ's second coming. Um, as I alluded to earlier, the thing that really broke my heart about Georgia now, whether or not the, the voting was accurate, I tend to agree with Mary that it wasn't accurate, but it was heartbreaking to think that Georgia, where you would think that because it's the Bible Belt, people would embrace Christian principles, <clears throat> and here there was a candidate that claims to be a minister, a reverend, and he's advocating Things like the, the slaughter of unborn children. What was the number one cause of death in the world this past year? And I'm not talking U.S., I'm talking in the world. Yeah, abortion. Anybody here have any idea how many babies were aborted? They estimate? I mean, I guess these are numbers that are hard facts. You have any idea how many they aborted worldwide last year? Now, here in the United States, since 1973, was it? When they... What? 73, when they passed Roe versus Wade, and of course, I think next Sunday morning is our Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. It's the third Sunday of January every year. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the total number of babies that have been killed since 1973, 60 million here in the U.S. That's just in the U.S. How many babies were killed worldwide last year through abortion? Over 40 million. Over 40 million babies slaughtered. And as I started to say, to tie this into it, here down in Georgia, you've got a man that calls himself a preacher that's advocating for the slaughter of the unborn. Now, I'll, I'll say this too. Yes. Yes. If a Republican does something, they absolutely crucify him. If a Democrat, it's total forgiveness. Look the other way. But at any rate, uh, and some people say, well, you shouldn't make a judgment. Again, don't twist the word of God. Jesus says, by their fruit, you're going to know them. Okay? You and I need to recognize fruit. And John is preaching that. I'm not just using that out of context. He says this toward the end of it. He says, if you're not producing fruit, you better look out. You're going to end up in the fire. And so John is trying to get people prepared for the coming of Jesus during his day. Of course, we're still preaching this message today because we're trying to get people prepared for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming again. And he's going to judge the world. Uh, so... We're going to go through this passage of Scripture. I know that our time is shorter today. But uh, do you have any comments or questions that... Th does it concern you, as it does me, that the church has become... And I'm picking on the church now. But within the ranks of those who call themselves believers, there has been an acceptance of things that the Bible clearly identifies as sin. Does it, does it bother you? It does me. I, I, I tell you this all the time. The church of today is not the same church that we grew up in. You and I have seen big changes of what's being tolerated. So this message is a, the lesson today is one that is applicable. Of course, the, the things that, that uh, 
John the Baptist basically warns people about. There's social concerns about whether or not people have food, whether or not they have clothing. But he is also concerned about righteousness, whether or not people are doing the right thing. And he particularly gets on to soldiers, and he gets on to tax collectors, and he says, you guys are not doing the right thing. You tax collectors are taking more money than you should, and you soldiers are taking advantage of people. And so I'm adding into this lesson, there's an app, uh, application today for us to be making sure that we are living as Jesus would want us to do. Turtle isn't here this morning, but oftentimes he'll talk about that rubber wristband he used to wear with the WWJD. What would Jesus do? And we need to ask ourselves that question about every area of our life. Our speech, our thoughts, as well as our actions. We need somebody to read the first passage of Scripture. Uh, Mary Collins, would you like to read the first passage out loud, please? Thank you. Good morning. He then said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance, and don't start saying to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Let those last words kind of sink into your brain a little bit. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. What fire are they talking about? Or as it talks about in Revelation, that hell and death are thrown into the lake of fire. But yeah, you're, you're right with regard. I, I don't want to get too technical. Because we oftentimes think of hell as being kind of a lake of fire. But it does actually say in the book of Revelation that hell and death are thrown into the lake of fire. And Jesus is warning. He says, look, if you're not producing good fruit. So it raises the question, are we saved by our good works. We are saved to do good works. It's proof of whether or not we have truly been saved. A person that hasn't been truly saved, they're not going to be producing good works. And again, if you're reading this passage of Scripture, look at the fruit. Back to the seventh verse, back to the top part of it said to the crowds who came out to be baptized, and again, this is John the Baptist, these people came out to him at the Jordan River. If uh, Dorothy Schaefer were here, she's been there to where they think that they did the baptism. Did you go there, Becky, when you were over in Israel to the Jordan River? I was baptized in the Jordan River. Were you? Yeah. Yeah, I was baptized. Um, I was baptized in the Jordan River. Yeah. Is it as wide as this room? This way? That it, way. It, that way. It's not this way. Big. Now it has places that it's bigger. And it's, yeah. but it's not, it, it's not a big river. So these people that came in, how far out of Jerusalem was this place, the Jordan River? Was it a 15 minute drive? Oh, we were on a bus tour. I have no yeah, idea. Okay. I mean, we were no all way over the place. That's okay. Well, anyhow, they came out of the Jerusalem, out of Jerusalem, 
to John the Baptist who was baptizing people there. And what does he say to those people that showed up? First words. What did he call them? Now, I don't, I don't want to use this to excuse us for calling people names. But I oftentimes think it wasn't just John the Baptist that called people names. Jesus did too. If I'm not mistaken, Matthew chapter 23, where he's got the, the warnings to the, the Pharisees and the scribes and so on and so forth, and the Sadducees. But, you know, I, I don't want to legitimize calling people names, but I'm, I always get a kick out of the fact John the Baptist wasn't afraid to call people what they were. And I, I think that we need to choose our words carefully. Uh, why do you think he used the word vipers? Poisonous. 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 When you read that in the Bible, what is the first story about a viper that comes to mind? Garden of Eden. And what did the viper represent? Devil. Devil. So it's more than just putting these guys down or these people down about, you know, acting like a bunch of snakes. He's actually, I feel like, comparing them to Satan himself. They are under the control of Satan. And he's warning them. He says, he says who warned you? Why'd you come out here? You come out here to see a show? Or did you come out here to do something about your lifestyle? He says, if you came out here to do something about your lifestyle, if you really want to please God, verse 8, produce fruit consistent with repentance. What's the difference between repentance and an apology? Yeah, that's the big difference. I mean, an apology, you may just say, well, I'm sorry for doing it, but you haven't necessarily made a promise. I'll never do it again. Repentance adds into the equation. They say that it literally means to do a 180, where you've been going one direction, you do a 180 degree turn, and you start going the other direction. And it means that you're willing to change your behavior. And he's, John the Baptist is basically saying, I may be reading too much into my statement here, but he's basically saying, if you're not willing to be serious about this and change your ways, then don't show up. Should that be preached at churches today? Again, you know, we, we read this in terms of we read this in terms of this is what happened in the Bible. But again, I believe these stories are for our benefit today. And let me say, I want people to come to church. I'm just trying to emphasize that church is serious business. It's not a box that you check off on your to-do list to say, well, I did that. It is, I told you before when I came into the state, Witcher Baptist Church in Bell, West Virginia had on their sign in front of their church building. The church is a workshop, not a rest home. It is a place that we come, yeah, it is a sanctuary, but it is a place that we come to do business with God and to hear God speak to our hearts and to work on changing us. And says, listen, I want you to produce fruit. I want you to demonstrate that you really are serious about trying to please God. And if you're not serious about it, then look out. Because as you go through the rest of this statement that Mary read, that we've got printed here, if you're not serious about it, you're going to be facing judgment one of these days. The people, many times, they wanted to excuse themselves. They said, well, we don't too much worry about it producing good works because we're God's chosen people. The men would end up saying, 
we've been circumcised. We've ended up observing all of these festivals. We watch what kind of food we eat. And Jesus would come along and say, you know what? Those really don't make a big difference in the eyes of God. If your flesh is circumcised, but your heart isn't, God's not pleased. And even though you don't eat certain foods, it's not those foods or your dirty hands that are defiling you. It's those things that are coming from out of your heart. So don't don't sit around and try to justify your behavior and say, you know, we come from good stock. Everything's good. Jesus says, uh-uh. I'm telling you this. Or, or John the Baptist is saying, I'm telling you this. God can raise up children from what? What's that? Stones. How many of y'all have had children that came from stones? Their head is hard as a rock. Yep. And in fact, they may have even grown up into a full-fledged blockhead. Or a turtle. Or a turtle. <laughs> Taking on the turtle. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, God can God can do anything He wants. We recognize that. But John the Baptist is trying to say to these people, look, don't end up trying to hide behind a false protection. Your protection isn't in your family line. Your protection is in the attitude of your heart toward the God that you profess. This is a scary thought. But how many of us American church have said, God will never chastise anything with us because we give to missions, because we send Bibles, because we preach the gospel to the world. If that isn't our deceived self-righteousness, I don't know what is. Because nobody, nobody is exempt. Amen. And we should learn from history because the people in Jerusalem said the same thing in Jeremiah's day. Mm -hmm. They were saying it in Isaiah's day. Of course, Isaiah lived, you know, over a hundred years before Jeremiah. But they both said to the, the people of Jerusalem at that day, you keep hiding behind this false uh, protection that you're, you're special and, and protected in God's eyes and said, you know, your strength is in trying to live for God. It's not in your identity based on your bloodline. And of course we know that God did end up sinning. Jeremiah was out there warning the people and all the other ministers in Jeremiah's day were saying, don't pay attention to Jeremiah. We're good because we're God's people. And God showed that they weren't good. So he said this in that ninth verse. We're going to move to the next section. John the Baptist says, the Acts... Is already at the root of the trees. What do you think that means? What's that? Ready to get cut. Don't think that you've got a lot of time here, folks. Because God is fixing to lower the boom. Of course, they say in 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 my book that John the Baptist probably started his ministry, I think it said in, uh, between A.D. 25 and A.D. 29. So it was almost A.D. 30. And in A.D. 70, 40 years later, judgment fell on Jerusalem. That's when the Romans came in there, they got tired of seeing all the little stuff, all the stuff that was going on in Jerusalem, and man, they they lowered the boom on Jerusalem. So, yeah, it took another 40 years, but John the Baptist is saying, look, your time is short. I don't know what's going to happen here within America. As I said, I cannot believe the stuff that we've seen this week. 
know that I've talked with a couple people. They say, well, don't worry. Uh, two years from now, there's another election. I'm like, two years from now? I'm not sure what's going to happen in the next two weeks. I mean, I don't want to get hung up on that, on this, but can you believe the, the level of censorship and everything that, that we've seen this past week? Uh, in fact, I mean, like I said, I don't want to get stuck on this. There was a Democrat congressman or congress, up in Congress, and I don't know if it's more than just one. They are pushing to have Fox News taken off the airwaves. They want to shut down everything. As I said, this is just like what goes on over in communist China and over in communist Russia. You get the opportunity to, to proclaim to the people only what the government says. And, and the sad thing is, is that we've seen them do that now with social media. In fact, uh, the president, if you're not aware of all this, the president for the past year has constantly been under fire with Twitter. That's basically been, for the past four years, his only way of really communicating with the American people because the news so distorts everything that he says. He, he got tired of dealing with fake news, so he used Twitter. That's what he relied upon. So Twitter ended up shutting him down. So the president said, well, there are other platforms other than Twitter out there. There is a, another uh, platform, another thing that you can use on your phone to send out messages called Parler. He says, I will just go over to Parler. So, yeah, they ended up on the Google Play Store and the Apple Play Store. That's where you have to download these things. They're threatened to take it off of the Play Store They're so that you can't download Parler. I mean, it is absolute, total, incomplete shutting down. People say, why are, you, why are you dealing that with a lesson? Because this last verse ends up saying the axe is already at the root of the trees. In other words, look, you think that you've got a lot of time here? You need to start reading the signs. You remember we just had a lesson out of here talking about reading the signs? I think it was last week, you know? If, if you see red in the sky, red in the morning, Sailors take warning. Red at night, sailors delight. You feel a breeze coming out of the south, you end up saying, oh, it's going to be nice and warm. That's what happens. And John the Baptist is coming along and saying to his folks, look, you better start looking at the signs of the times. And I'm bringing this up about the changes that we have seen within the past week within our nation have been absolutely startling. Uh, so it's a warning that John the Baptist has given the people then. We are just echoing it today. Anybody that thinks, oh, we got lots of time, I think you'd better pay attention to what John the Baptist, he's not living in our day, but he would end up saying, you better start paying attention to the times and get yourself right with God now. Don't count on tomorrow. Questions or comments? Look at the second passage of Scripture. This one has to do with the people. What does repentance look like? Miss Becky, would you like to read it, please, out loud? Okay. Page 59. Uh, yeah, response. What then should we do? The crowds were asking him. He replied to them, the one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none. And the one who has food must do the same. How can you say to your brothers, I also came to be baptized? And they asked him, teacher, what should we do? He told them, don't collect any more than what you have been authorized. Some soldiers also questioned them, what should we do? He said to them, don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. Okay, the overall message <coughs> of this particular section is, faith without works is dead. <coughs> You need to demonstrate repentance. And there are some examples here. Now, this is not a complete list. Some people might say, well, it talks about those things, but I don't really have to worry. This is not a complete list. In every area of our life, we need to be asking the question that I referred to earlier about the rubber band on our wrist. What would Jesus do? He replies to them in, in verse 11. Now, this is one thing that we hear a lot about with the Democrat Party. 
about caring for the other people. They're not the only party, but they seem to be, they like to pride themselves. I, I, I find it so ironic, though, that their party is made up of the, the very richest people. The ones that this past year have ended up increasing their wealth by billions of dollars. Right? But anyhow, this is one of the things that he ends up saying needs to take place. The person that has two shirts must share with someone who has none. The one who has food must do the same. The problem that I have, I shouldn't say a problem, the difficulty that I find with this today is that, as I've told you before, here in our area, most people have clothing, most people have food. And if they don't, and I agree with you totally and completely, there are places around here, as I've said before, contact me, I can get in touch with the REACH program. I've done it. I've helped people get food. The church right there next to Angie's, I think it's like every Tuesday, you can walk in there and you can get, they have wax clothing, you can just go get it, no charge. It's all free. Now, here's the one thing that concerns me, and of course it is, is it difficult in our world today. I'm always bothered by how much we have here in our country versus people overseas. And I know trying to get it to them, that presents the difficulty. I do, and I'm, I've told you this before too, I get a little bit perturbed with people that end up thinking that we really have it hard here in the United States. People that think that they owe it to themselves to make a trip. Some, and you don't have to go very far. You can just go across the border down to Mexico and down in Central America to see real hardship. You know, and I struggle with how am I going to respond to God whenever I pass away with all the stuff that I have. And again, trying to get it to these people, many times you try to send it to these people, the government confiscates and never makes it to the people that it's intended to. But anyhow, this passage of Scripture is saying that you and I need to think about what God has blessed us with. We again, I'll, I'll repeat this, we again are not owners. We are stewards. We don't really own anything. Do I own something? I say, well, yeah, I own it. And then I die. And a person says, now who owns it? I say, ooh. <laughs> it ain't me. It ain't me, so they're not going to have to squabble over it. So the, the message here is make sure that you consider what you're doing with what God has blessed you with. You're going to have to give an account. That's the message that he's saying to these people. You're going to have to give an account for what you've done with what you've been blessed with. To the tax collectors, verse 12, they came to be baptized. They asked him, what, teacher, what should we do? He says, hey, don't take advantage of people. Don't collect any more than what you've been authorized to. That goes to the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus became very wealthy. People didn't like him because of it. Jesus told him to come down out of the tree, and Zacchaeus says, You know what, Lord? Today I made a decision. I'm going to give half of everything that I own to the poor. That is repentance. And if I've cheated anybody, wrongly, I'm going to pay them back four times as much. That is repentance. It's not just saying, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep what I've got. It means trying to make restitution if need be. Verse 14, some soldiers, they question, what should we do? What is a soldier known for? They're known for their force. They're you know, being able to enforce the law. It says, don't abuse your authority. Don't take money from anyone by force or by false accusations. You guys quit bullying people and beating people up. Have a heart of compassion. Um, I don't know whether to share this story or not. I guess I will. I do it not to create any problems. The other day, um, right next to me, my neighbor has been parking in front of his house. 
and it's become very, very muddy. We're talking ruts this deep. That's not an exaggeration. You can drive down and see it. And I have been working out of my, around my driveway, putting in some new sandbags. Some of the sandbags that I had, the plastic had deteriorated, and so I took the sand and put it over at another neighbor's house that was needing some because he got out of his vehicle and was all muddy and stuff. And he told me that I could do it. So I finished my project, went in the house, and when I came out, I was going somewhere. And when I got to the side of my driveway, I noticed that there was mud all over my driveway, up the side of my porch, even on, on my porch itself. Where my neighbor that parked over there, he got in his van and was spinning out one, throwing mud all over the place. So you know how far apart the houses are. On it's not the first time it happened. It happened once here a couple of years ago. I went and talked to him about it. So I started to go to my, my, my car, and I thought, no, I really do need to go and talk to him about it, because this can't go on. And so I went and knocked on the door. And then one of the kids came to the door first, and I says, is, is your mom here? He says, yeah. So she ended up coming to the door. And I, I says, you know, there's a lot of mud <laughs> over here. We really need to do something about this. And she was crying. She says, I know. She says, we, we'll get the thing straightened out. I says, now you're upset about something. Would you like to talk about it? And she said, yeah. Um, my husband, he's been dealing with, I think it's bipolar, said that he was very upset and said that she, he tore out of here a few minutes ago in the van and said that he was going to go somewhere and kill himself. And I says, well, don't worry about this other. Would you like me to have her with you? She says, yes. I would like that very much. So I put my arm around her shoulder and I stood there and had her with her. And after I left and I came home a little bit later on, I went over to check on him and he was at home. And he said that things were somewhat better. And he and I talked before about this Bible because he says, you know, I've really struggled with it this summer. And I said to him, I says, listen, man, you know, this other stuff, I'm not so much concerned about that as I am about you. You got a family here. You got a wife and three kids that need you. And I said, I don't want anything to happen to you. If there's something I could do to help you out, I want to help you. He appreciated it. And I'm only telling you that because many times you and I be put in a position that, you know, we can, the soldiers, you know, they. They have the authority. They have a right to do something, and you can take advantage of it. As a neighbor, I probably had a right to be upset. But Jesus isn't asking us necessarily to, to do what we maybe could end up doing by force. It's to start caring about people. You know? When people are hurt, don't hurt them more. Be sensitive to the needs of those around you. I continue to pray for him. And, you know, these are tough times for everybody. And you and I know that January, right after the first of the year, is when more people take their lives than any other time of the year. The reality of life sets in. And so, I, I use that example, and again, not to pat myself on the back, but just so to offer to each one of you. Use the opportunities of, the, of your position to be a servant of God, to help um, those that are hurting. Uh, comments or questions? Let me just very quickly finish this up. Verse, page 61. Miss Betty, would you like to read that one out loud for us, please? Page 68, yes, ma'am. Thank you.
So we're going to close this up. It says, now, the people were waiting expecting, expectantly. You know, all of them were questioning their hearts whether John might be the Messiah. And John says, no, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not the Messiah. I'm, I'm only baptizing you folks with water. Water was symbolic of, you know, kind of a cleansing, you know, with the baptism. According to what, what, what I read the book, and I remember which of the two it was, it said that if you were a Gentile and wanted to become a Jew, you had to be baptized. John is saying, look, you Jews are the one that need to be baptized. You folks need to be baptized. And it, he says, but I'm only baptizing you in water. The person that, that's coming after me, I'm not even to do the lowest job in a person's household, which is to take a person's sandals off. I'm not. He said that this person that I'm talking about, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Because I want you to know, his winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear the threshing floor. He's going to gather the wheat into the barn. But the chaff, that that's worthless, he is going to burn with fire that never goes out. And I know I've told you before, I've heard people say, that, oh, I can't believe in a God that's going to put people in a place of torment forever and ever. You read it time and time again in the Word of God, you've got John the Baptist here talking about it. You've got Jesus ended up saying it. You've got John the Revelator talking about it. You know, there is... So many places in the Word of God that talks about it. And it says, with many other exhortations, John the Baptist proclaimed the good news to people. You say, well, that doesn't sound like good news to me. The good news is you've been warned. The good news is Jesus saves. Jesus is somebody that wants to come in and change us. You know? Uh, and I pray that you and I will... Until God calls us home, continue to work at our at our Christian life. You know, I, I don't believe that it's one of those things that all of a sudden we become perfect. No, the Apostle Paul continued to work. And he even got down on himself. You know, I don't understand why I keep messing up here. Doing the things that I don't want to do and the things that I do want to do, I don't do. He says, I, I don't know what, how it's going to finally be worked out except that... One day I'll get the victory through Jesus Christ. So any final questions or comments? Thank you for your patience. I was thinking yesterday when I called the hospital. And they put me on hold. And they said that message to me. Thank you for your patience. And I wanted to say I wish that my patient was out of there. <laughs> okay. And Lord willing, she will be. Father, we thank you for the lesson this morning that we really need to take seriously. Our, our discipleship. Father, we pray that you might help us to hear John the Baptist warning us. The time is short. We pray, Father, that you might impress upon us those things that we need to change through the help of your Spirit. Help us in growing into the likeness of your Son. Thank you for the reminder today. Help this message to work in our lives this week. Bless now the service to follow. Use it for your glory. And now, Father, bring us back here at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.